Hello, Thursday. Welcome. I swear these weeks are going faster and faster. I can't. Like, we were just here. We were literally just here about a week ago. And here we are again. Let me turn this around. Hello, Rosalind. Thank you for joining. I appreciate it. Welcome to Ask Serena Live. Let me fix this. Hey, thank you for joining and saying hello. I love when people jump on and say hello and don't just hang in the back. So, hey. So, hey guys, happy Thursday. Welcome to Ask Serena Live. Hey, Kimberly, I am Janine Truitt. And let me tell you a little bit about me. So I'm Janine Truitt. I'm the Chief Innovations Officer for Talent Think Innovations, LLC, based in Port Jefferson, New York. And Talent Think is a business strategy and management consulting firm where I focus on HR and talent management strategy, digital marketing strategy, brand influencer marketing, executive leadership coaching, and tech and women-owned business advisory. So that's a little bit about me. Hey, Brian. And this here is my little show that I do every Thursday at 11 p.m. where we discuss pretty much whatever the hell I want to talk about. <laughs> but for the month of March, being that it's Women's History Month, I have decided to not kind of look at things from a historical standpoint. What up? Um, but instead, I've decided to look at the things, the issues, the concerns that we have as women and have tried to kind of lend my voice to those items. So this is now, it's you and the, uh, hey, do what you got to do. I understand March Madness. I don't follow it, but I get it. So do what you have to do. I appreciate it. Um, so yes. <laughs> multitasking. I know you know best where that's concerned, Brian. So yeah, so that's what we've been doing this month. And so tonight, um, I'm going to be discussing pay equity for women. Um, and you'll notice that the topic that I chose or the title that I told is about getting your dollars and cents together. So it's a little bit of a play on words. I could have just said cents. I do know how to spell cents. Um, C-E-N-T-S, <laughs> but I use that because it really, um, for me, is about what I'm going to share is really much about how much we're making, how are we going after the dollars that are available to us, and the mindset. Makes sense? <laughs> I can't with you, Brian. <laughs> um, and the mindset, because it really is a mindset. And it's about shifting your mindset so that we can hopefully progress. Like hopefully by the time any of my two daughters are grown adults, we won't still be having this discussion about women not being paid their due. Like I'm praying, praying that that's the case. So before I kind of delve in and start discussing the topic, I do want to frame it for you. I always have articles that I'm looking at. Um, to make sure that I have good data and some other ideas around the topic that I discussed. So I wanted to share with you the articles that kind of inspired this talk, just in case I forget. So um, the first one is Racial Wealth Gap Persists Despite Degree, and that one is by the New York Times. Um, really good article, not really specific to gender, um, but more specific to race. And I think it's important to understand um, what's happening at a racial level to really pick apart and understand like what also happens at a gender level. Um, the second article, and it's actually not really an article, it's actually a study and it's a really, really good study. Um, it's by Amer the American Association of University Women and it's called The Simple Truth About the Gender Gap. And to me, it's quite powerful and poignant because they're basically, you know, sh pumping their fists and telling all these men and all these other people that are telling us ladies that like this thing doesn't exist to take a hike um, because they've got the data and they pulled it all together in one place. So if you're interested in 
something that has a lot, a lot of great data, then this would be great, the simple truth about gender pay gap. And the third, um, which we'll touch on a bit, is the AIR index. It's the pay gap for workers with disabilities. And so that's not something that gets a lot of playtime um, in general, and certainly not a lot of playtime when we talk about gender. So there's one thing to talk about, the gender pay gap, and it's another thing if you're a woman and also a woman who's differently abled or disabled, however you want to address that. So we'll look at that as well. So I wanted to make sure that you guys knew where I was getting all my information from. So pay equity. This is like near and dear to my heart because we ladies are coming up immensely short. I mean, really, really short. And I've been kind of framing this whole conversation over a few periscopes now. I've discussed different parts of the issue, but it really is a travesty. Hey, Lataria. So many, many um, periscopes ago, I had discussed the rise of the woman entrepreneur and even more specifically, the black woman entrepreneur. And so I had shared some stats about the fact that on the whole, women, on the whole, hey girl, on the whole, women make 79 cents on the dollar um, that their male counterparts make, right? So that's 79 cents, that's holistically, all women, period. But then when you start to break it down by racial demographics, right? And so that's why I said that first article by New York Times is important to read to understand um, how this plays out from a racial perspective. Blacks get 64 cents on the dollar. 64 cents on every dollar that a man makes. Latinas make 54 cents on every dollar that a white male makes. 54 cents. And so I also said to you, I'm throwing those that are differently abled into this, right? So when we look at people, persons who are differently abled, disabled, they are also at the threshold with blacks, which is 64 cents on every dollar that a white male makes. So, you know, it's wonderful to look at it and say, okay, 79 cents. If you look at most media outlets and most articles, everybody tends to focus in on the 79%, which is fine, except it becomes a more stark difference when you start to break it down by these other minorities or other demographics, right? And so the picture and the outlook looks far worse. So you have like all women, blacks, Latinas, and then those that are differently abled. And I also said, as an entrepreneur, Really though, Brian? <laughs> and I completely know what you mean by that. I can't even. So the thing is with this is that we, as much as we've kind of narrowed the gap a lot since the 60s, um, and that's largely because women are not as much, we make what we, well, yeah, yes, yes. We make what we negotiate for, except it's been my experience. So let me go back to that. In business, as a business owner, yes, I have made what I've negotiated for. And for whatever reason, that works. Although I can have a whole nother periscope and discussion about how people have tried to lowball me in my rates as an entrepreneur. And that's a separate topic. Um, now, was it because I was a woman? I don't know. <laughs> right, I don't know. I think we all entrepreneurs have gone through that kind of thing. In some cases, do I believe that it may have had something to do with race? Yeah. No, because you're a business owner. Well, yeah, but there is a sentiment. There's a sentiment that me as a black woman, and I'm not saying in every case, should I should not necessarily make as much as maybe a white woman or a white man. 
Agreed. And that's that's the mindset that I'm talking about. So people, women in specifically, we have to learn that it's not a done deal until it makes sense, until it makes dollar sense, right? And many times we, I think men get that a lot better than we do. I mentioned this on a recent podcast when I was asked whether um, men or women make better CEOs. And I basically said there are attributes that women have that just would lend themselves better in certain situations. I said, but then there's also other situations where I think men shine. And one of the ways that I said I felt men shine is in that art of negotiating. I know too many women who are lousy at negotiating. No, Brian, we've had this discussion before. So no, absolutely. I don't take that as pejorative or anything. But I, like I said, we've had this discussion and I basically said on this podcast that I think men really do excel at the art of negotiation. Men know how to, they walk into a situation having um, a full understanding of what they're up against. And they walk into business situations knowing what they want up front, knowing what they're worth, and also um, knowing how to get the person, how to negotiate to the outcome that they want to happen, basically. Right. And I think, I mean, it's not even just women. I think if I talk about from a racial perspective, I think a lot of minorities, and I think women in specific, are of this mindset that they are to be grateful. You're taught this. I, Honest to God, that you're to be grateful for opportunities that are afforded you, right? And when you're taught that way and when you have that mindset, it takes your value out of the situation because now you're not thinking about what's going to be best for me, what puts me in the best situation, um, you know, does this make sense? You're thinking... I need to take this because I need to take this because I don't know if another opportunity is going to happen. So when you don't think, when you don't shift that mindset, right, <laughs> exactly. So the problem is, is you, you get into that mindset and you keep taking things because you feel like you're supposed to be grateful. But then in the end, the question that most people get stuck with is what am I actually grateful for? Because you're not getting paid your worth. You're working harder than most of your counterparts. That's a fact. There's been plenty of, uh, you know, data on that. And so what are you really doing? I mean, you're basically spinning your wheels. And in that New York Times article, I mean, they basically talk about how there's so there's disproportionately less wealth in the minority communities and this is even amongst women um because of how we look at money how we look at opportunity where we're kind of you know placing our money to work for us so i mean it's a change of mindset we should talk more about it. absolutely <laughs> yes so I mean, it's an issue. So, I mean, we can talk about the negotiation factor, which I honestly will own. I mean, even for myself, especially early in my career, nobody told me about negotiating. I mean, people made, jobs made me offers. And I was just like, I mean, I do my share of not, you know, checking to see like what was out there in the market. But like, by and large, I didn't negotiate. I just was like, okay, good opportunity. You know, thankful again, I graduated and here's a job right after graduation. All right, let me take it, you know, and on and on and on. You know, every job was like that. And I don't think it really hit me. Nice, very nice, Brian. Um, So yeah, I don't think it hit me, really, really hit me until maybe two jobs ago when I finally recognized like, wait, hold up. I'm working pretty much harder 
than most of my counterparts in each of these jobs. And, you know, they say don't discuss your salary, but let's keep it real. People discuss salaries. They do. I don't care how much you tell your employees not to discuss it. They do. And word does get out. And so, you know, in time, you would be having these discussions, especially when you work for a crappy place and everybody's just the morale shit and everybody's just kind of like, ugh, I hate this place. So, you you know, you're behind closed doors and you're commiserating with one another and then it starts to come out. Well, how much do you get paid? Well, how much do you get paid? And then you're like, huh, really? <laughs> you know, and so you have those discussions and... Needless to say, it does not make you feel good to find out that people that are working less than you or not even, maybe they're working just as hard as you are, but somehow they got a better deal than you do. It's not a nice feeling. So, you know, part of that, again, is the fact that we don't negotiate, um, which brings me to a tip. I believe you shouldn't Absolutely, you should work for a company that appreciates you. But I think part of the thing is up front, before you even take the job and they offer you, they're like, hey, you know, here's the job, here's your offer letter, here's what we're able to offer you. Negotiate. That's my, why is there a rule that we shouldn't? <sighs> you know what, Lataria? I don't know what the reason is, but I know many places that I've worked don't they frown upon it I'd have to my guesstimate is this they don't want people to discuss salaries because they're not doing things above board so yes there's a negotiating factor in the sense that as women as minorities whatever we need to negotiate better did the people in charge of course they did of course they did listen right well yeah, and see, like, just that quick, you'd be like, I'm out, I'm done. And that's a difference in and of itself. Um, but my thing is this, the negotiating fact, you know, the negotiations is one thing. And so I, anybody that I coach now, I tell them, listen, whatever they offer you, you always negotiate. You, it, there's no harm in negotiating. And I know this why. I know this because I was a recruiter. And time, hands over fists, every time that I would, you know, prepare an offer for somebody and they negotiated, very, very seldom did we not bump them up to what they wanted. Sometimes it was absurd, absurd amounts of money that they wanted to go up. And somehow, if they were worth it, we were able to squeak it out. So... You know, people, we have to negotiate right then. Do not ever take what they first give you. Do not ever take it. If they say 40 grand, negotiate. <laughs> if they say 50 grand and that was your, the, the groundbreaking whatever, like that was the salary you wanted to make and it would rock your world, negotiate. If it's 100 grand, negotiate. Like I can't even impress this to you more do not take whatever because there's always wiggle room so let me give let me just frame it for you so you understand because this is stuff that most people don't know many salary ranges are at you have a minimum you have a mid and you have a max right when the job goes out and gets posted for the most part most companies unless they understand that they're trying to be competitive. Companies have to decide from a compensation standpoint whether they want to lag the market, lead the market, or just kind of meet it somewhere in the middle. That's what compensation's for, and they decide that. So thank you, Brian. So basically, when they post a job, many of them are going to tell the recruiter, we want to keep you between the minimum and the mid. Keep them between the min and the mid, period. The only way you're getting closer to the midpoint is that you really are rocking it. Like you meet all the minimum requirements plus if they have preferred requirements. So if you meet all of that, you're going to get closer to the mid and maybe over the mid and closer to the max. They never want you at the max. So if they publish a salary, which many companies don't because they don't want to like 
count anybody out that may look at it and say, hey, that's not in my ballpark. But if they do publish it or if they share it with you in a phone interview and you see this mid in your max and you're like, hey, that would be fantastic. Just know that you will not get close to that max. They're never wanting you to get close to the max. The, I've In my entire career, I can count probably on one hand how many people I've ever made an offer to who have gotten close to the max. And those people were like creme de la creme. Like when I say you need to be rocking it, no, like they far exceeded, rocked it. That that's how they got. Because they like to be able to let you have some wiggle room. They want to bring you in at a place that's kind of cushy so that like if you're great, they can seem like they're kind of bumping you up the ladder little by little. But if they bring you at the max, it's the max. There's just no more. And then, you know, those salary ranges only shift but so often. So just keep that in mind. Um, but by and large, they're going to bring you in at the minimum. So if they're bringing you in within the minimum, let's just say if we're dealing with like a forty to $65,000 range and you're, let's just say you're entry level and they're like, okay, we're going to offer you 42. Look how much further you have to go. 42, I come back to them and I say, hey, I want 46. Maybe you come, they come back and they say, hey, we can do 45. You win. Because you negotiated, you know, vice versa. If they get you close to the mid and the mid is like 52 and some change, don't take the 52. You say, I want 55. What's the worst they can say? No, we can't do it. That happens. But at least you tried. But you've got to negotiate. So like that's the first level at which you have to be kind of like looking out for yourself, advocating is right before you're about to enter the company. So that's the first part. The second time is once you're in the organization and now you're performing, you're in your job, you're in your role, you're doing your job, whatever the case is. And now here comes performance evaluation time. You better be ready to negotiate. So for me, I always had a running list of all of the visible projects that I was doing. I always had a running list of things that I was doing, things that I accomplished, milestones, who I worked with, because, you know, some managers have like selective amnesia and seem to not know what their people are doing, but you want to be sure that they know what you're doing and that you're keeping tabs on that. Even when they were like, yeah, we can just give cost of living, you go back and say, hey, I appreciate the cost of living, but here's where I excelled this year. Here's what I did for the company. Here's how much money I was able to save the company. I really see my raise being here. And even there, they have ranges. There's tiered things. So like, you know, the minimum, if you meet standards, it may be like 3.5% raise that you get. But then, you know, if you're exceeding, if you've got this long list of things that you've been doing, you probably should be more at the 4 to 6% raise or 4 to 8%, whatever it is. So why not negotiate to that end? So even then, you shouldn't be taking what they give you. And they should be able to give you an answer as to why you're not able to get something higher. You can't be afraid to have those discussions. Like, I perfectly understand from where the fear comes because I was that person but it is there's nothing more frustrating than to be in a job and be doing work day in and day out which is time away from your family time away from crap you really want to be doing like let's be honest who really works because they want to work we work because we have to work some of us are very fortunate to do work we love but by and large most people are just working to get by so if that's the case you better, something's got to match up. Either you better love the work that you're doing or you better be paid handsomely to do it and be able to live nicely so that once you leave the shithole or wherever it is that you're working, you feel like, okay, there's a reason for this. Nobody should be leaving a place of work and feeling like they're struggling or be living below the poverty line. It just doesn't make sense. And granted, that's rolling off my tongue like it's nothing, 
it's easier said than done. So I'm talking about all these ways that you should be negotiating. But the fact of the matter is, in many regards, there's just a system, just like there is with racism, just like there is with any other kind of discrimination. There's a system, an institution in this country, in the U.S., where they won't allow certain groups of people to be great. And so there's something to be said for that. So like you can bang your head against the wall and try all these things that I'm telling you about. And you may come back to me and say, hey, Janine, like, why am I not getting anywhere? Well, here you heard it. <laughs> there's an institution. And until we start to change that, um, we're going to continue to have issues. You know, there are just some places, whether it's legal or not, companies will find the loopholes and they will do the things that are not right. Hence the reason why we have Lily Ledbetter. If you're not familiar with that piece of legislation that was put in um, as of 2009 as a result of this woman, Lily Ledbetter, who, you know, I think she worked for Goodyear and basically, you know, there was some um, sex-based, gender-based discrimination that went on with regard to her wages. She was doing similar work to her male counterparts not being paid adequately and it became a federal case um that they almost tried to throw out but president obama put in this act that you know kind of regulated the statute the time in which you can actually report these kind of things and basically made it illegal for anybody working for a federal contractor to um make gender-based decisions where it regards compensation so we're making some progress, but even still, when I talk about this institution, there's still an institution. So let me go a little further. There is um, a new piece of legislation on the table, has been for the past two years called the Paycheck, it is the Paycheck um, Fairness Act. The Paycheck Fairness Act. And two senator, a senator and a representative from Connecticut um, basically developed it. And what they're wanting to do is have a closer eye on compensation um, for women in specific be looked at on a regular basis. They've actually called on Department of Labor to have more regulations um, tightened up around compensation reporting and that kind of data. So they want to heighten that. It's been on the table for two years. Now, I'm not telling you how to vote come November. But I will tell you this, the Republicans have shot it down twice that it's been to the floor, twice. So if you're passionate about pay equity, if you're passionate about them really, really getting their hands on how women are paid and making sure that we really obliterate discrimination, pay attention to this piece of legislation because it can't pass. They will not pass it because the Republicans will not pass it. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Enough about that politics, but I just wanted to share it. So I can sit here and I can tell you what you need to do. And honestly, it'll help you. And it's so important to make sure I'm able to Absolutely. Except we've got to get people out of the mindset that we're just grateful give me a job i'm grateful <laughs> give me anything i need it it you don't need it if it's not the best thing for you and your family and as i shared two periscopes ago with regard to women and mothers right a lot of people don't i mean if you really think about if i had to guess i don't really have the data around this but if i had to really guess the people who take the time to do the research Right. And the thing is, is that information's out there because you know what? Now that we have social media, all these people are screaming at the top of their lungs at the first second that a company does anything wrong. And in fact, the bigger the company is, the more risk they're in in terms of any employee blowing them up on social media or writing some kind of open letter. I already discussed the young lady with Yelp and what she did with that. And we see where that went and she's not been the first, she won't be the last. Um, so, but I have a theory that I think the more educated you are, I think the higher up the food chain you are in terms of being 
at a professional level, I think you will find more of those people doing the due diligence and looking up companies and worrying about all these different intricacies. I think when you start to talk about like entry level employees, sometimes I'm like, how did you, that is right. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, because I think the lower you go in terms of skill level, they're not thinking about that. You're talking about a mindset of, I need a job like yesterday. I have bills out the wazoo. I've got kids to feed, mortgages to pay. I need a job. And so part of me feels like, you know, to almost to just grateful, right? And we have to stop being so dang on grateful because what are they really doing for us? Nobody is rich. Nobody's getting rich off of working for anybody, at least none that I've seen, unless you're sitting at the CEO level or something like that. There's no there's no real wealth. There's very few companies. Every once and again, you'll hear of one, you know, because they were on Undercover Boss or, you know, somebody seems to hear about a mom and pop that's doing it right. But by and large, nobody's getting rich over it. And most people that I meet are damn well miserable in their jobs, quite frankly. I mean, they do it because they have to do it and because they fear what's on the other side of not having the job. So what's on the side of not having the job, I mean, is either one, a better job, if you want to look at it, you know, glass half full kind of thing, is another job potentially, and or it's like what I've done, which is that I've just left my job and tried something completely different for myself. Yeah, I mean, I used to be one of those people, just so grateful. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, I'm so grateful. Oh, yes. You know, going above and beyond and doing that. And that brings me to the next point. Sometimes as women, we do too much. We do way, way, way too much. And I know that personally. Men, they come in. You, they know what they're tasked with. They do what they're supposed to do. Not saying that they don't go above and beyond, but we, if they go above and beyond, we go way above and beyond to the point where we start to undermine our own progress. Give me a project. I'll do some projects. Oh, is there anything else you want to delegate to me? I'll do that too. Oh, that problem needs to be fixed? Oh, I'll fix that too. I just had a discussion with a colleague of mine who is working with a senior level person who is struggling herself because she's raising her hand for every damn thing, everything. New project, me. Can somebody do da 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 da? Me. Can somebody work on that? Me. It's too much. And unfortunately, I mean, in a very logical world, absolutely, Lataria, I saw what you said. In a logical world, you would think that, yes, because I'm showing effort, because I'm putting that much more effort, that it would actually get me someplace. If we worked in a world that worked like this, it would all be fine. It would make sense. But it ain't like that. Actually, it works a little bit more like you make yourself too available for all of these different things. They can't quite picture you in leadership because in leadership, there's a different kind of professional. Right, exactly. Oh, I've had, so I've actually not had men take credit for my projects. What really, really burns me, Lataria, is when I've worked for women. And it's like, you would think that in the sisterhood, they know what it is, like they understand what it is. But they would take credit for my work. That would piss me off because it's like you're me or you were me at some point. And so why are you taking something that I've done and making it your own? So I'm glad you brought that up. There is a certain semblance of we're our own worst enemy. And I'm going to talk about it more in an article very soon um, in the sense that like all of this feminism stuff, all of this pay equity stuff, none of this is really new, but it's reached a fever pitch, right? And so it's just always perplexing to me when I encounter women in the workplace 
who aren't reaching back to try to bring up their fellow sister, but instead stabbing them in the back. It's always perplexing to me when I work with another woman and somehow, and this is coming from an entrepreneur standpoint, somehow they don't see my work as valuable as their own insofar as they want to see me paid less than they get paid. I've had to check a few people on things like that. Like, wait, so you get paid that. So let me understand. So you, you're you allowed to get paid that, but I'm not. How does that work? And so we can point the finger. We can talk about the institution, the system, and all that other stuff. But we've got to also check ourselves and see how we're treating one another in all situations because that doesn't make sense. If I know what I want to get paid and I'm working with another business owner and they say, look, this is my rate, that's your rate. And it's either going to work or it's not going to work. But I'm going to respect you as another woman that that's what you need to get paid to do your work. And we're going to work with that. But I'm not here to lowball you in a time where we are struggling collectively to get paid our worth. That is absurd. It is absurd. So, you know, I really need all these women who have made it, so to speak, and gotten up into the rafters to stop the nonsense, you know, because that's, I think, where we, you know, we could excel, but we're trying too hard to play a man's game. Men are men, you know, they bully each other, they bounce each other, whatever it is they do, and then they get the business done. We don't operate like that. That's just not how we are as women. So I don't, get when I see women get to that point and they just start stabbing you in the back or stabbing one another in the back and there's this very catty feel and suddenly there's just no advocacy for other women to even rise the ranks in the company unless you comment they're talking about them right exactly don't talk about it but then in practice you're not doing anything about it you know basically if I'm not like complimenting you and I mean this is true story when I've worked in organizations if I'm not complimenting you on your shoes or if super smelling themselves if I don't compliment you on your shoes if I'm not going to lunch with you if you're not all in my business my personal life whatever suddenly I'm your enemy or if or wait if I'm smart and I actually want to move up and you see me as a threat. And so you try to thwart me trying to move up the ranks. And so you undermine everything that I do. That's friggin' disgusting. And it happens more often than not because every single time that I've discussed toxic women in the workplace or leadership, I have gotten a bevy of letters from other women telling me like, yep, yep. Do you work in my workplace? Because that happens there too. So yeah, it's the politics. And we don't really do politics. But I think we think that because we're women and we're up against men in other leadership positions, that that's the role that we need to play. Instead of us changing it to what is much more natural for a woman, we just kind of play into the politics thinking that that's what is going to get us to the next level. And the funny thing about it is hand over fist, just about every single woman who's ever tried to cross me or ever stabbed me in my back and was sitting up there smug, none of them have their jobs now. Not a one. They all fell. Not at once, but over time, they all ended up losing their posts. So that just goes to show you that that is not where we need to be with this thing. Like, if anything, we need to be changing the conversation in the C-suite. Yep. So, you know, if anything, we should be changing the conversation in the C-suite, but we don't need to become the C-suite because there's some shit that goes on up there that isn't copacetic. It's not cool. It's not good. Just like I spoke to you about the compensation and not, you know, discussing rates and what people make and that kind of stuff case in point that's something that you should be able to discuss if you choose that's why we have to get it together so. absolutely and i'm just praying to that point Lateria. i'm praying like you're building your thing i'm building my thing i'm just praying that all of these women business owners that are going into entrepreneurship are planning to do it differently 
Absolutely. Absolutely. We're already failing because as it as it is, we're not I don't know when we're catching up with this pay gap. I don't know when it's going to happen. I mean, we have this day coming up, April 14th, that's been designated as Equal Pay Day in which everybody and their mother gets on social media and talks about pay equity. And while I think it's a novel idea and I think it's definitely great to uh, raise awareness around it, eventually they will. Definitely, definitely. I mean, just the sheer numbers of women that are going into business for themselves is a problem for the workforce. It's a problem because that's a whole segment demographic of the workforce, of the pool of people available to work that they will not have available. And the work isn't going down, it's going up. So who's gonna do this work? They're complaining about the millennials, right? The millennials ain't good enough, they don't have enough soft skills, hard skills, whatever. The older people, well, you know, some of them are good, the rest of them can move on. You're alienating the women, mothers, people with disabilities. Wait, hold on. I needed to help you guys understand this. So one of the articles, 65% of people without disabilities. Right. We've had this discussion, Liz Harriet. It's disgusting. Listen to this statistic. 65% of people without disabilities are employable. Okay. If you have a disability, the employment rate for you is 27%. 27%. So it's 27% if you have a disability. Couple that with what's happening holistically for women in general. And then if you happen to be a woman of color, Latina or black and disabled, what's the outlook look like for you? What does that look like? And I'm not saying this to scare anybody. I'm just saying this like, this is, that shouldn't be. That shouldn't be. I mean, that's extremely low. And you can't tell me that it's that low because of negotiation. Those people in particular, those with disabilities, it's a population I work with heavily. They want to work. They want to work more than some people who are abled. But the question is, is where the business is at that are willing to take them on? They're able, they're willing. Maybe in some cases you've got to tweak a few things to make things work, but it's all in the realm of being reasonable. And I've actually built programs for companies with this and had immense difficulty trying to convince the company that there is a benefit in hiring a person with disabilities. In 2016, where we're supposed to be all loving one another and inclusive and everybody's talking about inclusiveness and diversity and it's all crap. It's all crap. It's all crap. If you really wanna hire somebody, whether they are disabled, a woman, whatever, you'll do it. You'll make it work. Whatever it is that you have to make work, you will make it work. So I just get really tickled when I see all of these articles about, oh, you know, the new trend for 2016. CEOs are saying that they are still um, interested in, you know, talent shortage. There's a talent shortage going on. Really? There's a talent shortage going on? Well, there's a pay shortage for sure. Talent shortage... I don't know that I'm as convinced because all I see is these numbers are extremely stark and I see all these demographics of people who could potentially work who nobody wants to work with. What up with that? I'm just saying. So, you know, again, negotiating is important. I kind of shared with you some behind the scenes of what goes on in HR and why it's so important for you to negotiate. They laugh when you don't negotiate because they get a deal. It's like if you have a coupon for like 75% of the product you're about to purchase and you go to the register, you're going to be chuckling all the way to the register because you're about to get a deal. 
they're getting a deal on your labor if you don't negotiate. They're getting a deal on your services if you're an entrepreneur if you don't negotiate. I'll give you one quick thing before I even let you go. Recently, I had to raise my rates. And so I sat and I'm thinking like, okay, you know, how much do, extra do I want to charge for my speaking fees? And so I'm going through it. And then I read an article and like it just clicked for me. Like, raise your rate. The guy basically says, listen, you should be getting paid what your resume says. So that is to say, if your resume is like spectacular, you've done all these things, you've been on boards, you've been written up by things. Makes me think of who had last name better. Absolutely. When you know better, you do better. And so he's like, if you've done all these things in your career, your pay should mirror that. And I was like, heck yeah, it should mirror that. And so I raised my rate $1,500. And I remember somebody asked me in my circle, like, hey, aren't you afraid that you might lose the speaking gig if you don't raise it? And I was like, absolutely not. Because it's not mine until we negotiate what I feel I'm worth and whether that gets paid or not. It's it's not even a done deal until they agree to that. And so I sent it off. I didn't even pray on it. I was just like, it is what it is because I know I'm worth it. And guess what? I got it. It's all good. I'm still here. It's all good. And if I didn't get it, it would be fine. But it just goes to show you that we can't be afraid to go after what we want. We can't be afraid to not have a job because we think it's the best thing since sliced bread when it really isn't. We can't be afraid to negotiate and have those discussions with people about what we know we're worth. People, absolutely, people pay for what they want all the time. There are some broke people right now in the hood who don't have a pot to piss in, but they will find some money to go to a Beyonce concert. They will find some money for some new makeup brushes or the newest palette by Anastasia or whatever. I'm just giving you the spectrum. People will find money for what they want. So when I come to people or people come and engage me about my business and they ask me my rate and then I get a gasp like, oh, I'm sorry. Well, maybe this is not, I may not be the person for you. It's not a problem. You might want to find somebody else with a rate that's more in your range, but I'm not changing my rate for you. Nope, not at all. So I hope this is helpful. <laughs> I really hope this is helpful. Please share this with other women who are struggling with this because I'm not saying this to be mean. I'm not saying any of this to be pejorative. I was that woman who was ever so grateful for every opportunity that was given to me, but it never got me anywhere. Thank you, Lataria. It never got me anywhere. And so I stopped being so grateful. I'm grateful for opportunities that come my way that fit the schema that I needed to. And that means me being paid my due. So share, share, share. I'm glad that it was helpful. No. Nobody talks about negotiating and it's the key thing. It's the key thing. It's like the secret sauce to you not only getting paid your worth, but building wealth for yourself and your family. Okay, that's a whole nother thing. All of this nonsense on Periscope about, oh, how you can make 10 grand in a month. And that's a whole nother thing. Like, I feel like I need an entrepreneur summit to just address that. <laughs> it's re This is reality. This is like, I sat in an HR desk. I've done compensation models for companies. I know what they do and what they don't do. And I know what's available and what people are unable to tap into when they don't know what they don't know. Yes. <laughs> Please do. So thank you so much for joining me today. Um, what can I tell you about what's on the blog? I'm talking about the unpolitical worker. We spent a lot of time talking about politics and things that go on in organizations. So I actually have broken down the effects of politics on somebody who doesn't really love it. If you are interested, you can find that at the aristocracyofhr.com. Um, I don't have a new YouTube up this week, but I will by tomorrow. 
So, oh, thanks, Lateria. Thanks. I think you shared it. Thank you so much. Um, so, yes, definitely check YouTube because I'll have something up and new tomorrow. Um, you can check that out. And obviously, always the replays are on my YouTube channel as well. And that's pretty much all I got. Next week is Hot Topics. It's the last week um, before the end of the month. So the Hot Topics will be all centered around something having to do with women. Um, it'll be fun. It'll be cool. And hopefully you'll join me. So thanks again. Great discussion. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Lataria. Thank you, Kimberly, on the assist. You're awesome. Um, Rosalind, thank you for popping in and saying hello. I appreciate it. And I will see you guys soon. Take care. Bye.